Welcome to Chapter 51 of the Kinsman Die Podcast, home of fantasy fiction based on Norse mythology that's written and read by me, Matt Bishop. In this podcast, I read my first novel, Kinsman Die, one chapter at a time. And with each episode, when it makes sense, I provide some commentary about the source materials I've referenced in the text. This week, we're back with Frigg. The last time we were with her, she was visiting some newly built longships along the river. She was attacked by the sons of Muspel, who set fire to the ships. Frigg's daughter Hermod chased after them. Frigg's son Balder got Frigg to safety and then braved the flames of a burning ship to rescue a child. Frigg thought her vision of Balder on a burning ship was coming true, but it did not. We rejoin her now the morning after those events. Chapter 51. Frigg. Her Frigg! Her Frigg! Please wake up, it's your son! Frigg lurched forward, bedclothes falling away. Light from the thrall's witch lamp stabbed at her eyes. She blinked, thought scrambling like startled rats. It was Gunnar. A witch lamp blazed in her hand. Lady Nana sent me, Hafrig. It's happening again. She can't get Jarl Balder to wake up. Frigg surged out of bed. Odin, wake up! She kicked the bed frame even as she whirled her cloak around her shoulders. She bent and tugged on her boots. Odin was already awake, a knife bright in his hand. Get that light out of my eyes. His eyes narrowed like they did when he spoke with his familiars. What's wrong? Of course he'd be unruffled. And where'd the knife come from? Balder needs us. Get moving. She spun on her heel and dashed out of the bedchamber. Behind her, she heard Odin say, Go with her. I'll be along. Three thuds of her feet on the planks and she was in the hall, running between pillars that rose like ship's masts. Her feet beat a quick rhythm across the platform where their chairs stood empty. Thralls, beginning their work, looked up in shock before bowing low. She ignored them, swept past the fire pits, dodged between the last pair of pillars, and slipped through the middle doorway into day's first promise of light. Balder and Nana were staying in a small house down the road. Smaller longhouses sat on the eastern quarter of the old hill's bare top. She stretched out her arms, winter's breath cold on her skin, and flickered into her falcon shape. The rapid rhythm of her feet became the beating of her wings. Hadn't she just made the same flight a few nights ago? This had to stop. They had to figure out what was happening. There, a third on the left, a thrall beside an open door. She flared her wings before the house, booted feet touching frozen earth. She set one hand on the low roof and turned back, looking for Odin. She saw only the long shadows thrown by Sol's first rays. She ducked inside. Nana sat sobbing in the embrace of an older Osir, a house thrall. The woman looked up when she heard Frigg approach. Gray hair peeked out below her simple white cap. She gestured with one hand toward a second thrall a golden olivar who stood, hands clasping and unclasping, between the weeping Nana and the recumbent form of her son. Frigg inhaled sharply. The room seemed to spin, and she staggered forward to kneel beside Balder. His skin was white, his mouth sagged open, and his eyes stared sightlessly. Where is Air? On her way as well, all mother, Gunnar gasped from behind her. I sent Fulla to fetch her. Frigg reached out a hand, caressing his brow as she had when he was a boy. Cold as stone. Is any of that elixir here? Trembling, she laid her other hand on his chest and pressed it down, feeling for something. Anything. There. Yes. Just there. The slightest movement. The door banged open. Startled, she glanced over her shoulder. Odin stepped in, stooping to avoid the lintel. It's like he's dead, Odin, she said. Again. Was that her voice? So calm. And yet, what was that roaring in her ears, that pounding in her chest? She must push it away, push back from it, like standing in a skiff with one foot on the dock. Just push back and float. Let the current take her. Maybe the wind. And then drift. Get that cover off him, Frigg. Odin jabbed a finger at the Alvar. You there, thrall, keep those doors open. Frigg stood slowly, drawing the blankets back. Balder wore a knee-length tunic. The drifting skiff on which her mind had embarked rocked on the steep swell of her emotions. Odin stepped closer and touched her shoulder. 
She met his eyes. I'm going to take him outside, he said. I want clean ground beneath my feet and soil above me. She nodded. The Avar thrall slipped behind her, pulled the pin securing the second half of the main door, and shoved it open. Light and chill air swept in. Frigg's eyes fell on the older Asir. The woman held Donna tight and smoothed her hair. Odin got his arms under Baldur's knees and shoulders and easily lifted him out of bed. He staggered slightly, caught his balance, then turned and walked quickly from the longhouse out into the light. Frigg hurried to a clear spot and spread the blanket. Odin knelt and eased Baldur's body down. He looked up at her. I can feel his heart, Frigg. It beats slowly, and it's fading. She knelt opposite Odin, their son's body like a corpse between them. Odin set one hand on Baldur's brow, with the other he reached out for hers. She gripped it like she might a rope thrown from shore, riding the growing waves, her little skiff tossed this way and that. Air hadn't believed that Saul's light had anything to do with reviving Baldur. She'd said it was the elixir that had revived him. She looked up from her son's pale body. Odin's face, stony at the best of times, was like the ice-covered cliff beneath Heimdall's tower. This dream, this nightmare of Baldur's, was even worse this time. Odin gave her hand a comforting squeeze, then dug in his satchel. He withdrew a spindle and shears and unspooled a two-arms length of thread. The thin strand of witch thread luminesced in the wan light of dawn. He clipped the thread, tucked the spindle and shears away, and brought one end of the thread to his lips. He spoke a word, and the thread flared gold. He began to sing. As he did, he caught up the other end of the thread and touched it to Baldur's chest, plunging it in and then pulling it back out as if he were sewing. He passed the string up to Baldur's head, plunging it into one temple and out the other. Then he brought the thread back down to Baldur's heart and tied it off. He came to his knees then, one hand on Baldur's chest and one on his forehead, and kept singing as melodiously as the songs he'd sung to their children. A golden glow ran round and round between his hands along the thread. With each pass, color returned to Baldur's body. The glow faded, the thread vanished, Odin stopped singing. He removed his hands and Baldur gasped. With that intake of breath, color and warmth rushed back into her son. Baldur's eyes flew open and he tried to sit up. Odin supported the back of his head, looked into his son's wild eyes, and said, It's all right, Baldur, you're back. Yet again. She flung her arms around Baldur and hugged him tight. She had brought him into the world. Why did someone, or something, keep trying to steal him away? From the door to the longhouse came a familiar shriek. Nana rushed toward them, the old thrall following stiffly in her wake. Nana flung herself at Baldur, Odin barely moved in time, and hugged him to her. From within Nana's embrace, Baldur smiled, tiredly, and croaked, I'm all right, mother. She wiped her tears away and smiled. She was so very tired of hearing those words. Frigg's eyes lingered on the thralls bustling in the middle section of the house, where it bulged like a long ship's waist. She closed her eyes and stepped again into that sturdy skiff where, not an hour ago, she had tried to ride out the storm of her fears. Now, to the sound of pots clinking and brushes scrubbing, a gentle wind filled the sail in her mind and carried her softly home. I remember a line of torches leading up from a sea over which fog drifted. Baldur was saying, his voice quiet. I could hear a river's rush, and I felt the press of folk around me. Frigg opened her eyes. No visions danced above her son's head. That's it? she asked. Odin just grunted. Baldur's eyes fell on her, somewhat distant as if they sought to pick more details from the memory. I think so. I felt that someone was waiting for me and I kept looking over my shoulder. He rubbed his eyes, yawned, and with a wry grin said, So, yes, that's it. Nana patted his chest with one hand, then let it rest above his heart as if loath to be away from its reassuring beat. More might come back to you, Odin said. He sipped from his cup. 
Frigg kept her hands folded in her lap. She looked from Nana to Balder and then leaned away from Odin's warmth. A draft from the open door snuck down the back of her dress, and she shivered. Did none of them want to ask the obvious question? Fine. What if this happens again tomorrow morning, and the morning after, and the morning after that? Concerned expressions met hers. We need to do something about this. By we, you mean, of course, me, Odin said. He leaned forward and set his cup beside him. Of course I do. At Ithaval, you said you'd look into it, and you've done nothing about it since... That was the day before yesterday, Frigg. We've been a bit busy since then, he said. He shifted on the bench to more directly face her. Let's ride down to speak with my uncle this morning. Now. She made no effort to hide the impatience in her voice. Balder leaned in, the firelight gleaming in his eyes. I'd like to come with you. If not to speak with Mimir, then perhaps I could talk to the Norns? Stay here, rest, and deal with whatever you need to on our behalf. I'm sure the envoy would prefer to deal with you and Nana, Frigg added. Particularly now that your father sent Thor to fulfill his threat. Can I call him back? Such provocation will make it harder to reach an agreement, Balder said in a somewhat neutral tone. Perhaps it will make them more eager to deal with you than with me, Odin said. Before her husband could say anything more, she added, And you can discuss your plan to improve their roads and access to Ifington. Perhaps even more than that. A settlement outside Utgard itself. Baldur's eyes went wide and he looked from her to Odin. You've agreed to that, father? Odin's frown deepened. I've only agreed to entertain the possibility, to discuss the plan and its details. I have not yet approved anything at all. Frigg gripped Odin's hand hard, and he looked down at her and winked. Then he looked frankly at Balder. Approval would actually be up to you and Nana, assuming, that is, that I step down as Allfather. Well, folks, that was chapter 51 of Kinsman Die. I hope you enjoyed it. Frigg and Odin were awakened toward morning with urgent news. Balder's corpse-like slumber had returned. Odin managed to bring Balder back, and then we get a hint of what Balder experiences during his dreams. We also learned what Odin plans to do next, visit his uncle Mimir. And we have a subplot thread resurface. Odin appears willing to step down as Allfather. Next week, we're back with Hodor, the second son of Odin and Frigg. It's been a very long time since we were with him, chapter 38. And if you recall, he'd been trampled by a horse. Until then, if you have the time and inclination, please rate and or review the podcast. That helps boost the show's visibility as to sharing it. As always, I'm going to read from both the Bellows and Larrington translations of the Havamal, the sayings of the High One, Odin himself. Bellows, verse 51. Hotter than fire between false friends does friendship five days burn. When the sixth day comes, the fire cools. And ended is all the love. Larrington, verse 51. Hotter than fire between bad friends burns fondness for five days. But it dies down when the sixth day comes, and all that friendship goes to the bad. I personally found the meaning of this stanza a little obscure, but try replacing a friendship or fondness with infatuation. So you meet somebody and really hit it off, and then maybe after spending every moment together for a few days, or five, the passion fades and the friendship is ended. Thanks for listening.